So it's nice to see my friends from uh, the academy, some of my friends from the other educational educators from around the province, and an old friend from North York. So I'm absolutely thrilled. It's quite a surprise. <laughs> Not that. So what I want to do today is uh, tell you, well, first of all, we're going to work with science, science cynic in his ed TED talk. How great leaders inspire action reminds us that we should not jump straight to the what and the how. We should actually pay attention to the why. So the why is going to be the focus of my next uh, hour. <laughs> Twelve minutes. <laughs> so I really want us to think about why we should think differently about learning disabilities. We do have a problem. You know, there are lots of kids, people who are diagnosed with learning disabilities. And they're really having a heck of a time in school. And some of you might know some of these kids. That picture's for you. Uh, there's been a lot of progress, as we've heard today, and we're glad that more things need to be done. It isn't always about fixing the child, it's often about fixing the system. But in fairness, to do that, I think we really need to see the world differently. We need to really see it from a different place of understanding. And my goal today is to encourage you to question to observe, to think differently, and to frame issues in a holistic way beyond science and research. I ask you to zoom out, see the issues from afar, and with an historical eye, with an open mind, I'll offer you some things that have worked for me. Uh, they may not work for you, but perhaps thinking differently will in fact lead you to your own discoveries, and uh, you can share those. So let's go. Are you art, or are you science as a human being? Do you measure, count, evaluate numerically, statistically, scientifically, or do you have impressions, feelings, gut instincts? Like you both. But I have a different problem. I've always had some difficulty accepting some of the science or of learning disabilities and some of the practices arising from it. Now, in fairness, you have to also understand that I really love science and appreciate what they contribute to our understanding in all fields. But we are more than science. Our current Western culture leans towards science. We see this in all fields, including education, where high test scores are the holy grail. As Jonah Lehrer would say, science provides a very narrow definition of truth. Truth, in his mind, is only that which is measurable and quantifiable. The problem is, we, in all our humanity, or well beyond that. Science does not account for how they experience the world. And that's where art comes in. Art is the expression of our experience. And each and every one of us experiences the world differently. We have, in fact, different realities, different truths. Neuroscience tells us this too. We, humankind, are made of both art and science. Check out this book by Joan Allaire, The Prospects of Neuroscience for a great discussion on that from a, an arts and neuroscience perspective. Now, just because I question science doesn't mean I'm not in science. On the contrary, I merely wish to question the scientific of it. I'm really quite excited about the neuroscience and neuroplasticity research. It continues to redefine the truths for us. So let's take a look at some of the science of us. Our reality is limited by our senses. That's why we develop tools. Because tools help us better understand what is real, better understand the world around us. We develop tools because they stretch our edges. They magnify our sensitivities. They detect and measure things which we aren't even aware of. Our eyes and ears have physical limitations in terms of what we hear and see, right? We detect it is limited, but it's our reality, and it's what we think of as the reality. Same with smell, touch, sound, or taste, rather. So we create these machines, machines to augment our limited apparatus. apparatus. So now we have fMRI, and it registers blood flow in functioning areas of the brain. Active neurons consume more blood than idle neurons. And this is where a great deal of our current reality is being defined, as we've heard. And that's cruel stuff. We're still limited. So just remember, please, 
when you're trying to figure out something like MLBs, you're really looking at it in a very limited way, with a limited set of senses, with a limited set of lenses. It's only a limited view of the reality. Now, we're not just limited by our senses, we're also fooled by our senses. Because our minds impose meaning on what those, our physical selves perceive. These tabletops are exactly the same size and shape. Cougar, if you don't believe me, because I think you don't. Check it out. Our brain circuitry is triggered to see the tables in three dimensions. Form is dictated from the top down. And what we experience is the art of in us. It's the art of us. The mind is not a camera. So what we perceive is a result of art, not science. We are both art and science. There's another minor problem with truths. A lot of facts that have been discovered aren't facts at all. They're just simply not true. They appear true at the time, but other truths replace them at some point, once the science changed, or once our perceptions changed, or once our tools to perceive changed. At one point, the Earth was deemed to be flat. Well, not, <laughs> not like that, obviously, but you get the idea. Um, and one time, the Earth was deemed to be the center, and everything revolved around it. That's the geocentric uh, model of Ptolemy, and Galileo was a huge trend in the early 1600s were contradicting the Aristotelian view, which was also that of the church, which of course gets you the bigger trouble. And then phrenology, have you heard of that? Basically, it was considered that the shape and size of parts of the head were correlated with personality characteristics. This was around 1800 or so by Joseph Gall. But that was considered a great advance over the previous scientific model of the four humors, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. Or how about the discovery last week, or a couple of weeks ago, regarding the question of Einstein's theory of relativity? Anybody know about that? Science teachers over there, you're good, very good. Sure enough, particles have been discovered now traveling faster than the speed of light. That changes it up a bit. So we're looking at temporary truths. We have many claims and factual learning disabilities too. Some, some of these may in fact be temporary truths. And I, I might be totally wrong. I'm good with that, I don't really care. I just like to question, especially the new findings in neuroplasticity and neuroscience that, that are coming out. One example, once you have a learning disability, you have it for life. All you can do is work with it, accommodate it. Well, to me, being some of an old Piaget would do, the very different definition of accommodation uh, infers a change in the structures of the brain. Now, there is one truth I really, really like. Neuroscience, Peter Snyder says, what neuroscientists don't know about the mechanisms of cognition, about what is physically different between a dumb brain and a smart one, and how to make the first more like the second, could fill volumes. Actually, it does. He suggests that we're in sort of the Wild West. Now, these scientists, in their brilliance, you know, have developed theories and beliefs based on their interpretations and previous experiences. Their knowledge arose, as mine does, out of how they experienced the world. Their discoveries, their scientific discoveries, were a result of both art and science. As we saw, we impose our meaning on the world and on others. So we take our best guess, our educated guesses, of all that we try to understand, explain, and fix. Marianne Wolfe and others claim that the brain isn't necessarily pre-wired to read. Check Proust and Squid for that uh, convincing discussion. But we know these kids suffer in our world. But as you also know, there are other gifts and strengths that often accompany all these. It is said that dyslexic could be our most talented data visualizer. Thomas West has said in his book, The Mind's Eye, for some 400 or 500 years, we have had our schools teaching basically the skills of the medieval clerk, reading, writing, counting, and memorizing texts. Now we are on the verge of a new era, and will emphasize a very different set of skills, those of a Renaissance person, such as Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Traits that are considered desirable today will be obsolete and unwanted tomorrow, perhaps. 
Instead of the qualities of a well-trained clerk, you might want a habit of innovation in many diverse fields, the perspective of the global generalist rather than a narrowly focused specialist, and an emphasis on visual content and analysis over parallel verbal models. We are in the 21st century now, past, past the Gutenberg parenthesis. That era lived, that lived and breathed text, and text alone. That era that celebrated the literacy and served to exclude those who were challenged by it, not so socially inclusive. We are now entering a world that is immersed in production and interpretation of visual imagery and visualizations. Those who are not literate in those areas may well be our next healthy kids. Daniel Payne makes similar claims in his book, The Whole New Mind. So what else can we do besides recognizing this different giftedness? We need kids to love learning. We need kids to love themselves. It is the natural way. Let's follow their path, not impose ours. Emotions impact cognition. Again, intuitively, many of us have understood this over time. Emotions are essential to the decision-making process since they are the engine of the limbic system, our emotional brain, which is connected to learning and motivation, says Antonio Damasio in this incredible book that's just come out called Pedagogy in Emotion. Set by his Zambrano or T's, the E is in brackets. Cognitive science has typically studied how people think, learn, perceive, remember. The role of emotions has been largely absent in the literature until recently. The neurosciences have now explicitly accepted the importance of emotions in the production of knowledge. This includes impacting the development and efficacy of executive function. I've always had a sign in my classroom doors. If you fall in love, you become an expert. When we're seeing those, that sign on the construction zone, that's why. So engage the emotions of your students by urging them in authentic tasks, real tasks that are meaningful to them. Give them power over their learning by encouraging and supporting their development of deep, driving questions to arouse their passion. Allow them to work with others so they can find their place and work in their areas of strengths, not suffer uh, in their deficit areas, have them work with their assets. I spoke and written lots about this, so you can check that out online um, um, for more details on, on passion-driven, inquiry-based, collaborative, project-based learning. I'm often in trouble. Perhaps it is because I'm a product of the 60s, of a revolution, an anti-establishment. But, but I think not. I think really it's because I like to question authority. Because authority, the common wisdom, sometimes just doesn't make sense to me. So I question authority. In fact, I used to have a sticker on my motorcycle helmet. Okay, that's what the shop did, because I don't have it on anymore, because honestly, the police did not find it quite as uh, intellectually stimulating as I did. I have questioned uh, some common practices in classrooms where kids have been identified as LEDs. Now, these things may not work for you, as I said, but I've had tremendous success with these on various occasions. They do fly in the face of common recommendations. It's just the way I roll. In schools, common practices often include a very reductionist approach. I understand why. To reduce the complexity of competing stimuli, to simplify the material, take it to its barest elements, and to logically sequence it. I think there is a place for that. However, I don't think it should be the main course of a student's life. I think that the complexity of life is essential for a passionate engagement in the world. I believe that the complexity is required for making sense of the whole and its parts. I've had a classroom in the school called the Construction Zone. Construction and Constructive Business Zone, so the Proximate Development Flow, the high each and the high um, By all rights, LD kids should not have done well in that space. Too busy, too distracting, too unmanaged. And I have been accused ever since I started teaching of being too laissez-faire. But I expect kids not just to learn the content at hand, I expect them to manage the learning of that content as well, and also to take responsibility for the learning of their peers. I think people should make their learning as, as explicit and as visible as possible. 
and that included the teacher. So I had multiple projectors running with kids working on their tasks and everyone else able to see the content and the processes as they work. I would have my Twitter stream running and projected so the kids would understand and see how I learned in this 21st century and how I learned my PLM, my personal learning network, or professional learning community. The students, like very young children, seem to know how to steal that which they need to know. We need to build thoughtful environments, both face-to-face -face and with blogs, we need Facebook, Twitter, names, all that stuff. Ones that support multimedia minds in natural collaborative endeavors. And obviously there's a lot of great tools around, including assistive technologies and uh, two-based tools. But alas, today I want to share the why. There isn't a great deal of time for the what and the how. Um, that will be part of TEDx YMCA Academy 2.0, I trust. You can visit these sites uh, if you can't wait. At this point, I invite you all to think about the issues I've raised here. When you're studying learning disabilities, consider the science of it, but also remember that what we experience is also art. We are both art and science. Recognize that our view of the world is both limited by our senses and that we impose meaning based on what we already understand. That may not be an accurate picture. Remember that humankind's knowledge base is constantly under revision. What we see as truth today may not be the truth of tomorrow. Educate for these times and future times, not past times. Look at those natural models of learning that engender passion for that which enhances learning. So therefore, I ask you to question authority. But be wise, be smart, be learned, be a learner, and, and question authority. Thank you.